This program is brought to you by Ignite TV. Now you're in command. Visit rogers.com for more details. The show that celebrates those stories we all have about those experiences, large or small, simple or complex, happy or sad, that shape our lives. Please join me, Richard Eve Satoski, in welcoming today's three guests. But first, I'd like to acknowledge that we are on the traditional territory of the people of the Three Fires Confederacy, the Ojibwe, the Odawa, and the Potawatomi Nations. And we further give thanks to the Chippewas of Saugeen and the Chippewas of Nawash, now known collectively as the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation, as the traditional keepers of this land. So for our first guest today is Barry Randall with a life-changing story. Barry has spent most of his life enjoying the pleasures of Gray and Bruce counties, having lived in the area for the past 30 years. Moving up from Guelph in the early 90s, Barry has worked in environmental and ecotourism jobs and has spent the past 10 years with the social enterprise, the Sustainability Project. Now, living on the river in Owen Sound, Barry enjoys easy access to big water, big woods, and a loving partner. Please welcome Barry Randall. Thank Barry. You, Richard. Thank you. Well, thank you for having me here today. It's great to uh, be with uh, a bunch of folks that are part of the community and telling their stories. And I did think a lot about uh, what story I would tell when I was asked to do this. And uh, as I was thinking about that, I had an experience in Owen Sound that for me was a little bit life changing. So part of my story is gonna be telling you about that experience. But as I, as I listened to some of the other speakers earlier when I was uh, uh, doing some research on this program, uh, I thought I would tell you a little bit about my earlier life-changing experiences. And one in particular was uh, when I was a student at the uh, University of Waterloo. I was in environmental studies and uh, was having a great time at university. And in the beginning of third year, our, uh, I think there's about 80 of us in the overall environmental studies faculty and we did a field trip up into the Bruce Peninsula. Uh, for 10 days, uh, we stayed at the Red Bay Lodge, and uh, we had a good time there as well. And the ten, 10 of us that were a project team, our um, project was to go to Lion's Head Peninsula and research uh, and do all kinds of geologic and geo uh, geogra geographical social studies on the best site on the Lion's Head Peninsula for a nuclear power plant. So, back in the day, of course, Bruce Power was a big entity and Bruce County still is, and uh, some of us suspected that our, some of the staff at, the, at Waterloo were actually friends with the Premier. And we thought, could this be real, that there was actually a proposal to find a site on Lion's Head for a nuclear power plant? In any case, uh, we learned that it wasn't our job to question whether it should go there. Our job was to find out where it should go, site and situation. So we spent 10 days researching and doing social research as well, which meant going to the pub, of course, and meeting people. And I fell in love with Lion's Head. And at the end of the 10 days, um, we, of course, we all agreed that it shouldn't go here. But it wasn't our job to say that. It was our job to find the best place. So at the end of the 10 days, I wrote a report which said it should not go anywhere here for almost the same reasons that the other nine people used to describe where the best site would be in that area. We all got A's and went back to school, and, but it changed the way I was looking at university. And uh, my life changed at that point in many, many ways. Could it be 40 years later? A few years later, here we are. Uh, I've retired a couple of years ago from the organization and doing some volunteer work uh, in Owen Sound with the Harmony Center and organizing, was just finished organizing an event called the Changemaker Pub Night where we had great guest speakers all about 
groups in the area that are doing social change and environmental work. And I was just walking down uh, 3rd Avenue by the post office on my way to the Harmony Center to put up a nice big poster. And I watched a guy going across the street on 9th Street there, and he was wobbling a bit. And then he got about halfway across and did a bit of a circle, and then his legs crumpled and he went down. And as I usually do, I yell at the guy and I say, hey, hey, bud, what's going on? You okay? And no movement. So I, and this is, there was not much traffic that was, it was earlier in the, in the morning. And I ran across the road and found him. I looked at his face, his eyes were rolling. His, he was drooling out the mouth, out his nose. And he was still conscious. And I had him on his side and I'm saying, hey, bud, how's it going? What's, what's going on? And uh, he just kind of was mumbling and mumbling, and he said, Wa water, water. And I had a bottle of water, so I poured some on it. I didn't want to let him have my bottle because I didn't want him to choke, but I just poured some in his mouth and around his nose, and he coughed a bit, and, and then he was still on his side. And then I, he started getting more red in the face and eyes rolling, and then I realized he was, his breathing was stopping. So, and then, his breathing stopped and I rolled him on his back and I tried to recall the times when I did hockey coaching and things like that and, and that whole process. And so I was pumping him in the chest and trying to resuscitate him literally. And I didn't have my phone, it was a cold day, my, my old phone was frozen so it wasn't working. Guy pulled up beside me, I said, call 911. And uh, he, uh, he said, I don't have a phone. And people were driving by, kind of slowing down. Here we are in the middle of the road. And uh, I'm pumping on his chest, and I, I just, it was not really working, and I'm yelling at him. And then I had a, a hand on my shoulder, and I heard someone say, it's okay, I got this. And I look up, and it's a woman, and I move out of the way, and she jumps on this guy and just starts leveling him on the chest, resuscitating him the way you're supposed to. And uh, she had a naloxone kit with her, ready to go, but within a, a short time, he came to again, and we were talking to him, and one of the first things she said to him was, what's your name? And kept asking him that question, and eventually came, uh, I don't actually ever said his name, but once he got conscious, um, he actually, on his own, stood up. By that time, uh, EMS had been called, the stretcher was there, and uh, the first thing he said when he got up was, he just, he's okay, he just needs a smoke, you know? Nobody gave him a cigarette, but he, uh, they put him on, they said, we just want to take you in and have a look and see how it's going, and uh, so we got on the stretcher, off he went, and the EMS guys asked me, uh, so did he hit his head when he went down? And I said, no, he didn't, and they said, okay, thanks. And that's, that was it, before I knew it, I was standing in the middle of the street with everybody gone, including the, I thanked these, the women very much, but I was kind of in a state of shock. My gloves had been underneath this guy, so I found, oh, there's my gloves, I better pick them up. And uh, I didn't even go to the Harmony Center to put up the poster, I just was kind of in a bit of shock. And I walked home, and I breathed a lot. I, my, my, thankfully, my partner over the years has, I've learned a lot about breathing, and I did some breathing, and I went and sat by the river and uh, said to myself, wow, there's, there's stuff going on here that we need to fix. So what I did was I went back to United Way. Actually, I'd invited them to come to an event, and they brought some of these naloxone kits to this event that I had hosted, spread them out on the table. and. What we've agreed to do in the future is host an event that's going to be a training session on how to use naloxone. Because you open this kit up, you bring out a piece of paper. The first thing that it says on the top bit of the pa piece of paper is, first thing you say is, what's your name? So I found out this guy's name was Matthew. I've seen him a couple of times on the streets before, and he's looking good. Last time I saw him, he was wearing a naloxone kit around his waist. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Barry. You're welcome. Thank you.
Our next guest on the theme of new beginnings is none other than Emily B. Emily B., her husband Dennis, and daughter Lucy immigrated to Canada in April of 2002 and settled down in the Owen Sound area in the following year. Based in Annan, Emily is a member of the Owen Sound Artist Co-op, Southampton Arts, and Rural Gardens of Gray and Bruce. She aims to capture the beauty of nature via the mediums of ink on rice paper and acrylic on canvas. Ginkgo Footprints, her garden, is a true passion project that she and her husband have been cultivating for over a decade. So please join me in welcoming Emily. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Richard. English is my second language. I never thought about telling my story in English. In 2002, we landed at Toronto Airport as new immigrants. In the first couple of years, we had many embarrassments and stories that bring love to these days. One day, we were riding the bus to visit a friend in Toronto. As the bus approached to a store stop, we rushed to the door. The bus stopped, but the door remained closed. We waved the bus driver and tried to let him know we wanted to get off. After a few seconds, the bus, the door still closed. We heard a couple of voices said, step down, step down. We tried to step down one step. Same thing. As a matter of fact, we didn't know what that meant until a young guy who showed us by stepping down to the very first floor, the door opened automatically. Of course, other than thanks, uh, feeling thankful to this guy, we felt embarrassment. We felt embarrassed. Eating in a restaurant is always a fuzzy thing when your English is not good. I always felt flushed by the questions from waitress and the waiters after I order, such as, what kind of a sauce would you like? On the menu, it's so hard to wrap my head on the fact chicken is chicken meat. But the meat of cow is not called cow, it's called beef. The meat of a pig is called pork. The meat of sheep is called lamb. And then there are so many different uh, names for the cats of meat, such as stick, rib, tenderloin, uh, calf, shank, sirloins, sirloins. <sighs> and then I was asked, would you like mashed potato or baked baby ones? I said, huh? You said uh, baked baby something potatoes. That's the moment I learned baby could be used in tiny or small things. Although English plays such an important role in my daily life, there are some areas you really don't need much language, English, I mean, such as uh, gardening. For trees, shrubs, plants, they really don't care what language you speak to them or no language at all. They only care if you give them enough love by giving them right, mountain, uh, right water, soil, sunlight. In 2000, uh, um, I would say 15 years ago, 
we settled down in Annan, the outskirts of Wensan, to follow our gardening passion. We start with one plant, one peony purchase on sale. Eventually, we collected over 300 variety, all purchased across Ontario. Fortunately, start from the beginning, we also added many native plants. In order to share the peak of peony in bloom with as many as we could, in 2015, we start to open our door for our day in June. Gardening influences my art. Birds, bees, butterfly, plants, they are my favorite, favorite uh, subject. My favorite uh, read, uh, painting style is called ink washing, the ink on rice paper. I'm trying to use my own language, a special painting language. So, um, like a yeah, very fast and loose style. For a cardinal, I use one stroke for head, two strokes for body, and two for the tails. So one, two, three. That's my painting language. We are trying to build a path between gardening and art. Over years, our annual event goes far and wild. So we have thousands of visitors spreading in Ontario who visit us during our annual event. We are the host of this event. As a matter of fact, it's a whole community event. We've got lots of support from this community. This year, we are being marked our uh, 10th milestone, yeah, 10th anniversary for this annual event. We are going to have about 15 local presenters, uh, artists, and uh, uh, vendors. It should cover everything, almost everything about art and the gardening. Come and celebrate with us, no matter how you communicate to NN, by car or by bus. Please step down to our garden, enjoy the, uh, enjoy the language of the nature we created, Keep your eye, keep your eye out on the baby bees, baby butterflies, baby birds. For sure, you won't have any embarrassment. Just, just a joy in our garden. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Richard. You, Emily. Well, thank you, Emily. Thank you. And now so for our third guest who is none other than Zoe Kessler. Zoe Kessler has been a professional writer for nearly four decades. Her first book, Adoption Reunions, was a Canadian bestseller, and her second, ADHD, according to Zoe, led to her reputation as an expert in ADHD in women. Zoe has written for magazines such as Maclean's and Today's Parent, among others, and blogged for the Huffington Post and Psych Central, and she's co-produced a radio documentary for CBC Radio. Currently, Zoe works in a group home setting in Owen Sound, supporting adults with a wide range of mental health and addiction challenges. Please welcome Zoe. Hey. <laughs> All right. Thanks for having me. So I hope you're sitting down. I hope you have your seat belts fastened. I'm going to tell you a wild, and I mean wild, story. The themes I'm focusing on today are belonging and also my lifelong quest to answer the question, who am I? As an adoptee at 27, I had a reunion with my birth family and 
And that was great. It was one of the best things I ever did. It answered a lot of questions. But still, I, I continued to feel like I didn't really fit in to society. So 20 years later, I got a diagnosis of ADHD. <laughs> so again, I found a group of people with whom I belonged, the neurodivergent people. But I still didn't feel like I really fit in. I'm going to tell you why. There was one more aspect that's been ongoing for my entire life since childhood. And that is that I have had spontaneous, what some might call psychic or paranormal experiences, mystical states, you name it, it's run the gamut. So no wonder I feel different. <laughs> As an example, I've had precognitive dreams. I've had messages from beyond, not for me, but for my friend, with details I couldn't possibly have known. And none of these experiences, mind you, were under the influence of, well, I can't afford an ayahuasca retreat, but no, none of them were under the influence of anything. They were spontaneous. I'm going to share a story from my experiences with you right now for the first time ever. You're welcome. I was about, I was sort of, in my early 30s, working at the Children's Aid Society. And I don't know exactly what was going on in my life, but I found myself walking around my apartment saying out loud, someone stop the world, I want to get off. And I would say it over and over for a couple of weeks until I went to bed one night. And in that moment, just before falling asleep, I felt this pressure in both of my ears. It's quite pronounced, and I heard a rushing sound and I felt myself lifting off the bed and yes there was a beam of light coming in my window and I was terrified as one would be so I began to scream put me back put me back put me back and I felt the direction changing and when I felt myself back in my bed I had a sense of there were beings in my room, these little short guys, and we now know them in popular whatever as the greys. Okay, this all I realized sounds a bit much, but what really freaked me out was these guys were shaking their heads saying, jackass. <laughs> I, and I couldn't figure out for the life of me, why are you mad at me? You know, like why? They were irritated. So anyway, the next morning I woke up and I was still terrified and I went to work and I told my best friend at work what had happened and, and for about three days I really was shaken up. And then one day I suddenly remembered uh, I had been walking around for two weeks asking someone to stop the world. I want to get off. Well, <laughs> I put two and two together and as far as I'm concerned somebody did. Like, <laughs> who called the cap? Um, I mean, I can laugh about it now, but it really was, as one might imagine, it, it was a pretty traumatic experience. And while I'm not going to stand here and tell you I have had personal contact with extraterrestrials, because of my lifelong spontaneous experiences that some of which I've shared in people's faces would go white, this is my life. <laughs> So, yeah, I still feel a little bit different, but I'm happy to say that I have found a community online who have had similar experiences and with whom I can share who won't, um, you know, criticize, who will support. And, you know, the whole UFO, UAP phenomenon is really heating up right now. It's in the zeitgeist to the point where in the USA and other governments around the world, there are hearings happening where military personnel and commercial pilots are being invited in to share testimony about anomalous objects. So I think the time is right for these things to come out. The public wants disclosure and feels that we're ready to try and face this head on. And yet those of us who have had these kinds of experiences are being, we're not being consulted. We're being ignored or criticized or vilified are told we're crazy. And I mean, we've already had experiences that we can't explain that let's face it, they're not always fun and sometimes they're downright traumatizing. Even just the cognitive dissonance that this causes um, it, it leads one to feel very isolated and alone and frankly, just like my other two books, I think the longer 
we feel we have to, I mean, people have lost jobs when they've shared stories like this and family members and friends and I get it. But I think it's super unhealthy to hold in secrets like this, like any other secret. And our voices should be added to the research and the discussions that are happening now. And I think it's super unhealthy to hold it in. So that's, that's definitely how I feel about that. And you know, this is Western culture that I'm talking about. In some societies around the world, the Hopi, some First Nations communities, it's a given that star people are our ancestors and that, of course, this is where we all come from. But I live here, so I guess I'm deciding to boldly go where few in Canada or the Western world have gone before. Um, so I, I'm willing this year to lend my voice to this and going forward in the hope that we'll discover more and, uh, and that I will contribute to that. So, yeah, um, I guess that's my story. And um, beat me up, Scotty. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks so much. Oh, oh, you're still hugging me. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Zoe, for that amazing story. And I'd like to thank all three of our guests today for their wonderful accounts of life and their existence. And so I'd like to invite you all to our next episode. Until then, I'm Richard Eve Satoski. What's your story? Connect with us by visiting our website or email us at comments at rogerstv.com. Hi, I'm Tiffany James, the host of Her Story. Join us on Rogers TV as I interview various women in our community on how they found success in their own way. Buckle up, we're cleared for takeoff. Here we go, boys, here we go. 16 teams, one champion for the greatest trophy in sports. You know why I'm here. A time for new heroes to be born. This is a guy.